All right, welcome to the last uh, edition of the Bulldog World Order, unless uh, they do a, spo- a special show. And uh, here's Magnum, and Uncle Lou may or may not join us. Um, you know, he's still recovering. All right, uh, go ahead, Mr. Magnum. Uh, well, what's going on, guys? Uh, yeah, we unfortunately may not have Uncle Lou today. Uh, he is recovering from uh, knee surgery, I believe, is w- what it was. So, uh, if he's listening, you know, wish you well, buddy, and uh, get back up on your feet and uh, get back on this show. But anyway, uh, I know most people probably caught the National Signing Day yesterday. That's mainly the reason we're uh, doing this show today. Um, Georgia ended up with a pretty good recruiting class. Uh, depending on what website you looked at, um, I think 24-7 Sports had us ranked number eighth, I believe, uh, ESPN had us ranked ninth. So either way, Georgia had a uh, top ten class, and we're still waiting on one recruit. And uh, I don't know if you heard about this, Ray, but this is actually an interesting story. Um, four-star linebacker, uh, Roquan Smith, um, he's actually uh, from Georgia. Um, he narrowed his choices down to Georgia and UCLA. And most of us, you know, us Georgia fans, we're thinking, oh, we got this in the bag. Well, he comes out. And he actually uh, commits to UCLA by putting on gloves with UCLA's colors on. And needless to say, most Georgia fans are really upset with that. Well, here's the thing. That letter of intent never was signed and sent to UCLA. Why? Because uh, one of their coaches, his last name is Ulbrich, I believe, uh, he was hired, or reports say he was hired uh, by the Atlanta Falcons as their linebacking coach. And the only reason he was going to go to UCLA was because of this coach. So now he has reopened his uh, recruiting, and it seems like Georgia is the front runner to get this guy uh, as it stands right now. But I don't know how other Georgia fans feel about this, but the way I look at it, if he commits, okay, fine, it's whatever. But I'm under the opinion that, you know, he kind of pushed away UG, uh, UGA to go all the way out west over to UCLA with the beaches and the women and all that stuff. So, quite frankly, I could care less if he comes here. That's the way I feel about it. I mean, I don't know how anybody else looks at the situation, but he has to uh, come to Georgia. Just aside and decide to go with UCLA. Now that the coach is gone, you know, he opens up his recruiting back up, and it's just like, it's whatever, dude. If you come, come this not, you know, it, screw you. Um, what, what if, okay, Ray, what if, I don't know if you really got a college team, but let's say somebody that to your school. How would you feel about it? Like if he was uh, from your home state, he decided to go way out west or whatever, and then all of a sudden it, it falls through and he may want to come back. How would you look at that? You know, I, I wouldn't I would not have any respect for him. I, I'll tell you that much. Um you know, the fact that he, he dogged, uh, you, you know, um, uh, the Bulldogs and wore some other, you know, school's colors, and now it's like, okay, oh, well, I, I made a mistake, and now I want to come here. He, 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 he should have to prove himself more than anybody else. And, you know, he shouldn't, you know, just be given a position or a, you know, anything, um, you know, off the bat. I mean, he's, he, he screwed himself. Well, I mean, I don't know if, okay, I see where you're coming from. I don't know if I would use the term screw itself because I know that uh, Mark Rick, you know, and the coaches, they, they told the guy, you know, he, they told Roquan Smith that, you know, we're not going anywhere. So, to me, that, that tells me that they still want him to come to, to UGA. But you know, I, I, me as a fan, I, like I said, I can't speak for the rest of, UG, you know, the UGA fan base, but me as a fan, I'm looking at it like, you know, we, we're we his second choice, you know. Uh, he he decided to go to UCLA, which was his first choice, and that falls through. So now it, it, he may want to come back to UGA. And I, I mean, he's according to everybody. I mean, I've, I've read a lot of this guy. He seems like, you know, a really good player on the field. But I don't know, man. I just don't like the idea that he pushed us aside. And, if, like, if he commits, it's whatever. But... I'm not getting my hopes up because he already pushed us aside once. You know, who, who's to say that he's not going to decide to go somewhere else? You know, it's not a uh, a for sure thing he's going to come to UGA still. But 
it's just one of those situations that I just feel that, you know, and, and I mean, whatever I, happens, happens. I, also, how is he going to be perceived if he does come to, you know, Georgia after, you know, throwing a different team's colors up? Uh, well, that's a, that's a good question. I know you've got some fans that, of course, they'll welcome them with open arms, but then you got fans like me that it's just like, whatever, dude. I mean, if you want to be a dog, be a dog. If, if not, you know, we're not going to lose sleep over you because we got a lot of really good recruits yesterday. Um, one of the ones I was really hoping to get, and we did get, uh, the uh, defensive back, uh, his name is Rico McGraw. Uh, originally, he was committed uh, to Georgia, if I'm not mistaken, and then he decommitted from us, then uh, committed to Alabama, then decommitted from Alabama, and then decided to come back with us. We had a few guys that actually did that. Uh, Shaq Wilson, who was a uh, wide receiver, he was committed to us. Uh, and then about a week and a half ago or so, he de- he decommitted from us, decided to commit to West Virginia. And then uh, a day or two before National Signing Day, he decommits from West Virginia and decides to come back uh, to, U- to UGA. But the thing is, they were there uh, on – Excuse me. They were there on National Signing Day, and they uh, signed a letter of intent to uh, play football at the University of Georgia. Roquan Smith, however, on National Signing Day, gave gave Georgia the middle finger. If you know, that's the way I look at it. Okay, at least Shaq Wilson and Rico McGraw, you know, on National Signing Day, they they signed that paper. Roquan Smith on National Signing Day on TV, you know, to me gave UGA the middle finger. I mean, would you look at it that way? I certainly would look at it that way. I most certainly would look at it that way. Because, uh, you know, like I said, you don't wear another team's, you know, colors. I know in the NFL, if you do that, it, you know, most of the fan base ain't going to want you. <laughs> Period. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I can understand. Um, I know he, he technically was not part of – UGA to begin with because he never signed the the letter of intent. But the way I look at it is, you know, he is from Georgia. Uh, the, all the indication was there that he was going, you know, he was going to sign with Georgia and he was going to be a dog. Uh, all all my friends who are Georgia fans, um, I know a couple people I talked to, uh, people I've met online, Facebook, YouTube, all the the writing on the wall was there. We all thought that he was going to be a dog. But then I, I didn't even I didn't even know that Roquan Smith had a a close relationship with a UCLA coach. I when I read that report, I was like, where the hell did this come from? And it just completely caught me off guard. And the only I mean, I know that he supposedly was going to be UCLA because of the good relationship we had he had with that coach. But I'm sorry, you're you're an 18 year old kid. Why would you? What would be the only reason you would go out west really to, to play football? The beaches and the women. Am I correct? You most certainly are. I mean, now that that that's that's the only thing I could think of. I'm sorry, you're not going to travel all the way from your home state in Georgia, go all the way out to damn California for one freaking coach. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry, you're you're going there for more reasons than than just that. And what, what would be so appealing about UCLA football anyway? Uh, they're, they're, they're nothing. Uh, UCLA is a, a joke. Uh, I don't know what kind of education, you know, programs they get out there. I and mean, they may have some good educational programs, but, you know, these high-level recruits, they go to, to these schools to play football. I and mean, let's be honest here. They go to play football to try to make it to the NFL. Most of these guys could care less about education. I know you got some some of these guys that do want, you know, a good education, but most of these guys want to play professional football, you know, when they get out of college. But I mean, it's oh man, we're still waiting on Roquan Smith's decision. I don't even know. I haven't even heard anything new about uh, when he's supposed to make his decision. I don't, I don't even know. But uh, we did get a uh, who who was rated the number one defensive tackle in the nation, uh, Trent Thompson. Now this guy's a a monster coming out of high school. He's uh, six, I believe, six three or six four, uh, three hundred and eleven pounds, coming coming out of high school. Now that's that's a big boy coming straight out of high school. And uh, everything I've read on him, he's he's a monster. Uh, between him and uh, another recruit, we got Jonathan Ledbetter, 
Now, Ledbetter was one we stole from Alabama because he originally committed to Alabama, and uh, Jeremy Fruitt was uh, one of the ones that actually helped flip Ledbetter from Alabama to to Georgia, and I think that was a huge steal right there. That's uh, I don't know. Did you did you watch any of the um, National Signing Day at all yesterday? Uh, any any schools from Florida or whatever? Did you see anything? Unfortunately, I was so busy yesterday. I didn't. I didn't have time. I, I do apologize. Um, but I am seeing um, that Georgia twenty four seven sports uh, do have a new report that Smith is to wait at least a week before deciding. Okay. Okay. Did you just check that? Check on that. I did so. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. So, see, it's like we got to wait a whole. A week. We were all geared up for his decision on National Signing Day. Now we have to wait a whole nother damn week. That's that's some annoying ass shit right there. It's like, God, I mean, I understand that it's a big decision, but you have, you know, so long to make up your mind before National Signing Day. And if you can't make up your mind before National Signing Day, it's, I don't know, I I don't I think there's something wrong with you. I, you may I think he has commitment issues. Well, I mean. That's what I get from this. I think he has commitment issues. I I, I agree. Uh, I, I agree. I, I think he just doesn't think he's going to be perceived well in Georgia after what he did. Well, I mean, I don't think there's going to be anybody that, that hates him because, I mean, he was never, like I said, he had never signed a letter of intent to Georgia. He was never a dog to begin with. But... I don't think anybody's going to hate him. It's just, you know, for example, me. I look at him just like, you know, he pushed Georgia aside. If he decides to come to UGA, you know, that's fine. But if not, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it because, to me, you're either all dog or you're no dog. I mean, it's, there's no in-between. It's like you either want to wear the red and black or you don't. And if you don't, you can, you can get the fuck out. That's the way I look at it because um, – I think we talked about it in a, a few shows, maybe about a month, month and a half ago. But remember, we uh, talked about J.J. Green was going to transfer, you know, a running back uh, that was with Georgia. Correct. And uh, he did, he decided to transfer because he wasn't really getting any playing time or whatever. But, I mean, if you don't want to be a dog, we don't want you. Uh, that's the way I look at it. If if you want to be a dog, you know, and play your career, career at Georgia, then I'll support you, you know, every day. You know, twenty four seven, three hundred sixty five days out of the year. But if you don't want to be a dog, then you know why the hell are you here? I mean, don't you agree? Uh, I, I totally agree. I mean, if you gotta, you know, stick by your team, and you, you know, you gotta decide the right decision. Uh, the the whole thing is, you know, if it's over a coach, like you said, that there's no way it possibly was over one coach, unless he's the best coach ever. I mean, for you know, linebackers and everything. Um, it, it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. And you, you know, now that that coach went to the NFL, I, I think the guy's caught in a, uh, a bind too. Maybe wants to go to Georgia, but at the same time, doesn't want to be perceived as you know a bad guy because he did. He is from Georgia, and he chose not to go to Georgia to begin with. You know, I can agree with that. But here's something else too. Now, maybe if he, okay, let's say if. Uh, Florida was one of the schools that, that was trying to recruit him. Now, since that, that state is literally right next door to Georgia, I can understand him wanting to go, you know, over one state to be with a coach because it's not that far of a travel. You know, uh, that, that happens quite often. you got some kids that go out of state, but usually kids from, like, Florida or, or Georgia, um, Alabama, whatever, most of the time, you know, those kids are going to, stay in the south somewhere they may go out of state but more than likely they're going to stay in the south very rarely do you see what just took place yesterday a guy that completely goes cross country you really don't see that and that that shocked me i i mean i i know that ucla was one of the schools that you know that they were talking to him or whatever but i mean all the indication was you know he was going going to sign with georgia that's that's what we all got but well, we were kind of let down yesterday, but I think I think it is kind of funny that that coach ended up going to the NFL 
and you know now <laughs> he he he's he's probably confused. He don't know you know he don't know what to do now, and maybe he does need you know some time to to think about it and you know figure out what's best for him. But you know what? The way I look at it, he wouldn't have been in this problem to begin with if he would have simply picked UGA. See, when you don't pick UGA, you create problems for yourself. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I mean, being being he's from Georgia, that's understandable. But but, however, you know, we don't know the circumstances behind him. Maybe he wants to get away from his family. Maybe, you know, maybe he just wants to concentrate on his career, you know, and so he can get to the NFL level, and he just doesn't want any distractions. And maybe if he feels that his friends would have, you know, been too big of a distraction or whatever the case is. I, I don't know what the case is, but... It, you never know what's going on with somebody's, you know, mind. But the fact that, you know, that happened, it, that's kind of like karma. You, you know, you kind of you slapped the UGA in the in the face, and you you know you got offered to be there, and then you turn around and the school that you you're a hundred percent that you're going to, uh, the co the reason you're going there, is, <laughs> the coach is gone. Stuff happens like that sometimes. Yeah, and I'll tell you one thing that really irritated me. We had a uh, a long-time commit, wide receiver Darius Layton. Well, this guy yesterday decides to – well, it didn't actually happen yesterday, but a day or two before he decides to decommit from Georgia and actually uh, commit to Auburn. Now, I think it's no secret. Uh, every, everybody knows, and I'm pretty sure you know by now, my hatred for those assholes. So when he de decommitted from UGA and decided to, to join Auburn, my hate level for him just, just went up like a thousand times. It's like, you want to decommit from us and go to that shit school, especially one we beat 34-7. to 7. Well, you go ahead and knock yourself out, buddy. Hope you enjoy us kicking your fucking ass. You know, I, <laughs> I about lost it. Yeah. That, 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 that decision seriously irritated me because, you know, he, he had been – committed with UGA for, you know, for a long time, you know, and just within the last few days, he decides to flip to Auburn, and, and, and Gus Malzahn was actually trying to uh, flip Terry Godwin. Uh, he actually uh, stayed with Georgia, um, and he's, uh, Terry Godwin is a five-star uh, athlete, but uh, he played, you know, he can play several positions, but he's really known as a wide receiver, but a uh, five-star athlete, you know, uh, he has great film. If you get a chance, look him up, watch some of his film. I mean, the guy's a beast. Um, Gus Malzahn was trying to flip him. And yesterday on National Signing Day, he had uh, him and his family, they turned their backs to the TV. And their shirts, uh, when they all lined up next to each other, their shirts said still 100% dog or UGA or something like that. So uh, he stayed with Georgia even though Gus Malzahn was trying to flip him. Gus Malzahn was trying to come into our backyard and, like, steal our recruits. See, that's the thing about Auburn. This has been the case with them over the last several years. They can't recruit, you know, at all themselves. They either got to wait till we kick, you know, some players off the team and they, you know, sign them. And then after we recruit guys who've been committed with us for a long time, that at, at the last moment, Gus Malzahn wants to come in and try to, you know, steal them away. You know, Gus, Gus, Gus Malzahn and Auburn can, you know, piss off and die. I don't give a shit about that shit program. Okay, I think we got a caller, though. Hey, good morning. Oh, Uncle Lou, you made it. Yeah, yeah. sorry I'm a little bit uh, late. Uh, yeah. well, how you feeling, buddy? I'm flying high, sir. <laughs> but I did come home. I, I made it home from the hospital today. That's why I'm a little late calling in. I made it home and got all situated here and uh, and took some medicine, and it knocked me right out. I, so I overslept a little. Uh, hey, well, we understand, man. You're trying to recover from your surgery. Uh, did the process go really well? Did, did every you know no complications, nothing like that? Uh, no, the doctor said everything went fine. He did have to do. Uh, Instead of replacing, uh, he ended up having to replace three of my knee ligaments instead of one. So that's why the surgery itself took so long. I was in the surgery took nine hours, uh, which is just ridiculous. That's why I had to stay a second night in the hospital instead of getting to come home Wednesday because they had me under anesthesia for so long. But 
Um, he said uh, he said that it all went uh, according to plan, so should be should be good to go uh, eventually at some point down the road, which is great and amazing, dude. Yeah, obviously you were. Uh, I think you were feeling okay because I know you were doing some uh, YouTube videos from your hospital bed. So it, I was like, well, he must be doing okay because he's able to to do some YouTube videos, you know, all medicated and whatnot. And it was kind of funny because you were, you were talking about the video, and then every few minutes you was like, yeah, and I can't even remember what I was talking about. <laughs> Yeah, it was really it was really interesting because I was able to watch Uncle Lou videos as if I was somebody else because when I would go back and watch the video later, it was like it was like watching someone else's video for the first time because I really had no idea what I said or what I was doing in the videos. Uh, so it was like uh, it was like watching Uncle Lou videos, but but being someone else, it was. It was kind of a weird, uh, weird feeling uh, there, but uh, yeah, they treated Uncle Lou pretty good down there at the hospital, so no complaints there. Uh, and they got me home in, in one piece there, um, so I should uh, I should be good to go. I'll be laid up for a while, probably about six weeks before I can uh, do much anything, but. Uh, Hopefully this will fix the um, problem. This is the second surgery I've had on this knee. The first one didn't work out too well, so hopefully this one they get me fixed up a little better. But I think I told you yesterday, or I might have mentioned it in one of the videos, but uh, I got lucky and they actually had SEC Network at the hospital where I was at here in here in town. Um, yeah, I remember you uh, you uh, text me. Yeah, you text me and let me know they had the SEC Network. So yeah. I was like, yeah. At least you get to watch National Signing Day. Yeah, it was great. So I, I had it on the SEC network yesterday from, uh, you know, 8 or 9 in the morning all the way through the end of the – I even watched the, the Paul Feinbaum show through about 7 o'clock last night. So I was able to keep up with the, the flips and the flops and who was decommitting and who was recommitting and everything that was going on. Uh, and I wasn't necessarily able to remember all that stuff later, but uh, but it gave me something to do all day yesterday. So I stayed on top of everything as best I could, um, and, and I've, I've mentioned this about recruiting in general before, but, you know, I, I, I keep up with with recruiting to a certain extent throughout the year, but it's so hard to, unless you're going to keep up rec with recruiting as a full-time job, it, it's almost impossible to keep up with it because at the end of the day, you know, you're talking about 17 and 18 year old kids here who are telling the coaches what they want to hear a lot of time in terms of, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign with you, coach. Yeah, I'm gonna come there. But you know, until they actually sign on that dotted line and fax that paperwork in on National Signing Day, uh, it doesn't mean a whole lot to me. I, I, it's been too many times I've been excited about somebody coming to UGA. You know, just just to have them turn around on signing day and send a letter of intent somewhere else. So I try to yeah, avoid that, that we actually, by not yeah. getting too attached to any one to any one player. But with that being said, I was glad that we were able to hold on to our key targets. Uh, you know, of course, Trent Trent Thompson never wavered. He was a lock for Georgia from the word go. And uh, and he don't don't believe what ESPN or anybody else is trying to tell you now. Trent Thompson is, was and is the number one high school recruit in the country. The way that these things work, it, it's not exciting. If the number one recruit in the country commits to Georgia three months ahead of time, that's not exciting enough for ESPN. So they have to then pretend that some other guy is the number one recruit just because that other guy is not yet committed. And that's all you saw happening yesterday with that Byron Coward or whatever his name was that they were claiming was the number one player in the country. No. Trent Thompson was the number one player in the country. UGA locked him down months ago. So in the interest of exciting and or excitement and in the interest of ratings, ESPN tried to pretend that some somebody else was the number one player so that everyone would watch their networks all day yesterday trying to figure out where the number one player was going. I don't buy into that. Trent Thompson was the number year long. 
uh, and he's still the number one player now, and he's a dog in this story. Uh, not only Trent Thompson, but uh, you might have read this, Magnum, because it was all over the Internet yesterday, but UGA got six defensive linemen committed in this class that were ranked in the ESPN top 300. That's never happened before. So we just are we loaded up and are stacked now at defensive line for the next four years um, with legitimate four and five star uh, recruits. Um, the only other position of need that Uncle Lou was worried about was wide receiver, and I did get a little worried when we when we start when it looked like we were going to be losing a couple of the wide receivers. But I'm sure you've already mentioned this, but thank God we were able to stick with uh, that. Uh, what's his name? Terry Godwin. Yeah, yeah, I mentioned him uh, earlier in the show, and we actually stole – I haven't uh, got to this yet, but we actually stole one uh, that Les Miles was trying to recruit. Uh, I think it's Michael Chigbu or something like that. He's from uh, Louisiana. He's a wide receiver, and uh, he signed with us yesterday. Uh, We also got – I forget his – oh, Shaq Shaq Wilson. I talked a little bit about him, who uh, was committed to us, decommitted – from us, went to West Virginia, decommitted from West Virginia, and signed with us. So as far as I know, we got, you know, three receivers in, in this class. Of course, we did lose Darius Slayton, but keeping Terry Godwin was the main the main goal. I mean, that, that's, that's the five-star. What happened with Slayton? Who did, he, who did he end up switching? Was it Oklahoma State? Who? who, who? Slayton. Where did he end up switching to? Uh, Slayton? Yeah. Uh, I want to say, oh, uh, damn, it, he ended up going to, uh, I think it was Auburn. I do believe it was Auburn. Man, you need to tighten up your boys over there at Auburn, man. They can't be. Hey, hey, I, hey just before you called in, I was talking about those assholes because Gus Malzahn <laughs> had tried to, to flip Terry Godwin as well. And, it's, yeah. and I had made the statement, of course, that they can't really recruit on their own. They they got to wait to either somebody kicks players off the team, or uh, they got to try to go mess with somebody else's recruits. You know, uh, that 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 whole program can be non-existent, and it wouldn't bother me at all. I mean, if he wants to go to Auburn and get his ass whooped again, thirty-four to seven, well, by all means, go over there. We don't want you. If you're even considering Auburn, I don't want you. Yeah. Uh, that, that's yeah, you're right. I actually just looked it up here on the loop pad, and yeah, he he did he did flip over to Auburn. So far, as I'm with you. Good riddance. We didn't we didn't need you, sir. Uh, so yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, he can hit the road. Uh, he's from Atlanta. That's fine. Well, Malzahn, Malzahn was trying to flip Terry Godwin too, but you know Godwin. Yeah, was. His sister. His sister is a starting point guard for the Lady Dogs. Uh, <laughs> and he wasn't going nowhere. Like his, his oh, I didn't know that. Dog. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There, he wasn't going anywhere. Yeah, I didn't even know that. But his sister played. Uh, would you say basketball? Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, I, I hate that I missed the beginning of the show, and now I don't want to go over a bunch of stuff that you already went over. But uh, did 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 you mention the top five? Uh, teams. Uh, uh, to my overall recruiting classes? Yeah. Uh, no, who, I hadn't actually uh, got to that thing? yet. That, uh, after we finished uh, talking about you know some of you know who who we got and whatnot, I was actually going to get into that. But I do know, of course, Alabama number one class um, again. Florida State is number two, and depending on what. Of course, whatever re- recruiting site you follow, I mean, they're going to be different most of the time. But um, some sites had uh, USC number three. Um, I know some sites had, I think, maybe I saw Clemson right there number three. Number three. Do what? I saw some people had Clemson in the top five. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's what I was just saying too. It's like yeah, oh, man. If I had Clemson number three. Uh, 24-7 Sports has Georgia ranked 7th, I think. ESPN has us ranked 8th. Um, yeah. And like I was talking at the beginning of the show, uh, we got to wait a whole nother week before we get a decision from uh, Roquan Smith. Uh, you, you do know why he decommitted from uh, UCLA, because the coach he supposedly had a close relationship with 
uh, I think his last name is uh, Olbrit or something like that, weird name. But anyway, a uh, report came out uh, that the Atlanta Falcons had hired him to be their linebacker coach. And it turns out there actually is some truth to that. And uh, Roquan Smith uh, did not sign the letter of intent to UCLA. And now UGA is in the running form again. And if we get him, they're saying that that'll jump us up maybe another spot or two. But what I said at the beginning of the show, I don't know about you, but with me, um, he, sh- he he pretty much gave UGA the middle finger when he decided to go to UCLA. I'm under the opinion it's like, okay, if he decides to come to UGA, that's all fine and dandy. If we don't get him, I'm not going to lose any sleep over him because he had his opportunity to come to UGA. And, well, he just pretty much said, fuck y'all, and was actually going to go all the way out west. Speaking of UCLA, Snoop Dogg's son ended up picking UCLA. I don't know if you if that's something you've been following uh, or not. Yet. I mean, I, I knew I knew that, but I I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think I was even going to talk about it because I mean that's I I don't think that's any relevance to the SEC. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I just thought it was interesting. And the ESPN did a whole like six or six series. So documentary uh, on him and his whole recruitment process, and you know his whole senior year and uh, and all that. That's a lot of attention that he put on somebody. Uh, but uh, and I know he was considered LSU and Tennessee is the reason I mentioned it. They were in the top five. LSU and Tennessee were, <clears throat> but of course, he ended up going with UCLA. So uh, I guess there won't be any Snoop Dogg sightings in SEC stadiums uh, this year. No. Uh, speaking of Tennessee, did you hear who they hired as their offensive coordinator? Uh, no. They hired, I forget his name, but he was the uh, Michigan offensive coordinator uh, back in the 90s with uh, Lloyd Carr. That's really where he was best known. He's been out of football for several years, and when I read that article that they hired this guy, I immediately laughed, and I was like, yeah, so much for your fucking bricks. What a terrible hire. You guys are to the point where you can't even hire anybody that's in football right now because nobody wants to come to your shit program. you got to go look for somebody who's been out of football for a while. I mean, this wow. I mean, this guy wasn't even coaching right now? No. Oh, wow. Huh. I, wonder what, uh, I wonder what the Tennessee fans are going to have to say about that. I've been uh, keeping up uh, uh, keeping up with some of them on uh, Facebook because I'm in a couple of uh, you know SEC uh, football groups on Facebook. Some of them do not like it at all. Um, some of them said that they're, they're willing to give them a chance, but there was one Tennessee fan that straight up said, um, it, I, "I can't remember exactly word for word, but this is pretty much what he said." He was like, "Well, thanks, Butch, for fucking this program for the next two to three years." <laughs> so there, there's some of them that's that's not happy. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. You and and of course, a lot of Tennessee fans right now are so drunk on the Butch Jones Kool Aid that he could hire the Easter Bunny as the offensive coordinator, and you'd have that was a good idea if as long as Butch Jones said so, because they're so high on, on on this guy and his bricks and all this kind of stuff. But I see again he had a. Uh, another great haul yesterday as far as recruiting goes, I guess. Uh, second year in a row with a top five class. Um, but, you know, uh, I think this is something we've been over ad nauseum, but until they start putting up some significant wins on the field, it seems to me like it would be, as a Tennessee fan, it's hard to get excited about a recruiting class. I mean, you've had good recruiting classes in the past. Um, it, it's it's wins and losses to me that's the next step for Tennessee. Like, I thought Tennessee was past the point of saying, oh, we need some good recruiting classes. Uh, I thought they already had that. Uh, they were just waiting on their on their freshman bricks to become sophomore bricks. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so hard to, hard to uh, figure out what it is they're trying to do there. Yeah, well, I mean, this kind of, this hire right here, I mean, uh, if I was a Tennessee fan, I wouldn't like this hire myself because, like I said, this guy's been out of football for a little while. 
Um, apparently, he's supposed to be a, a, a guru as far as running out of the uh, eye formation. Um, but the way I look at it is, okay, with this new offensive coordinator coming in, um, you know, everybody on offense is going to have to learn this new system. I mean, I know, you know, they can talk about, oh, we got this guy coming back. Oh, we got Dobbs at quarterback. Well, I mean, yeah. You can't – I mean, I know you got some players back, but when you got to implement a new system, <laughs> I mean, who's to say that, you know, everything is going to click that first year? You know, who, who's to say that you're even going to be a good offense with a new offensive coordinator? I mean, it's not, it's not a guarantee, especially since your program has been yeah. a fucking dumpster fire for the last decade. It, it does seem like really bad timing to be trying to go out and hire a new offensive coordinator when – you know, you you played almost all freshmen last year, and your whole your whole you know mantra all season was, well, these are freshmen, so you know once they get a full year in this system, then watch out for next year. Well, now you know, yeah, these guys are going to be sophomores next year, but they're they're still going to be the first year running, you know, whatever rinky dink playbook this this guy that has been able to find a coaching job in the last 10 years brings in. So it seems yeah, like I mean, starting I, over. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's one way to look at it. I mean, when you implement a new offense, in a way, you are starting from scratch because you've got to learn this guy's playbook. And I know, I forget where he went. After he left Michigan, he actually became a head coach at some shit school. I forget what school it was, because I read about this guy on an article, and his head coaching record was 12-34. and 34. Uh, He couldn't even make it at a small school. So, and, he, and he's been out of football for the last several years. So what makes you think this guy who, who whose last experience in football was an epic fail, now he's been out of football for a little while, and you expect him to come into the SEC and immediately – bring your offense to to a level that's yeah. supposed to be competitive. Get the fuck out of here. Well, in 34, that's worse than Steve Spurrier's record with the Washington Redskins. Well, I, I wasn't really too familiar with his record at the Washington. I know it wasn't good, but, I mean, yeah, 12 and 34, that, that's that's really not something to be proud of, especially at a little shit school, wherever he, he was. I mean, if, yeah. if you can't make it at a little school, what makes you think you can cut it – you know, in the SEC. I mean, go back to their hire of uh, Derek Dooley, who I think his best season at Louisiana Tech was like seven and six, you know, and then they thought that, you know, he was going to be the next big thing. Well, we all know how that went. I mean, you know, why would you, why would you even bring somebody in that hasn't even been in football in the last several years? Now, maybe I could understand you wanting to bring a coach over that's coming from a small school, but goddamn, you're bringing in somebody that, that hasn't even been in football for several years. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I don't get that. Uh, that's a head scratcher there. Yeah, I, I don't get that. I mean, that's, whoo, man. I mean, that that's that's almost a, a, as bad as the Lane Kiffin I <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, now that signing day has, has come and went, um, I think we've already we've already sort of talked about uh, how we thought things were going to shape up in the SEC for next year. We talked about that on a previous show. Uh, now that signing day has has came and gone, uh, for the most part, you still have one or two stragglers that are going to wait wait and decide. Uh, and I and I get that, but for the most part, uh, for the most part, you can look at these teams now and, and see what their roster is going to look like next year. Um, who do you who do you think uh, are going to be the teams to beat coming out of the SEC next year? All right. Well, I'm going to start over in the West. Um, I think we talked about it on the previous show, maybe, but uh, Alabama is only returning two or three starters tops on offense, and they're returning seven starters on defense. So they're going to have to replace four guys on defense, and one of those guys was their best player on defense uh, in Landon Collins, the uh, probably arguably the best safety in the SEC the last, last couple of years. But mm-hmm. um, they they lose practically everybody on offense. And I'm sorry, 
uh, you bammers that want to run your fucking mouth about Derrick Henry and uh, what's uh, what, Kenyon Drake, those two bums don't bother me. Hell, Chubb himself damn near rushed about as as much as Ye- uh, Yeldon and uh, Henry combined last year. Yeah. I'm not worried about your fucking running backs. Uh, between Nick Chubb, Sonny Michelle, uh, healthy Keith Marshall is back. Uh, Brendan Douglas. I, I mean, our running game is going to be nasty. Um, I, that's I think that's going to be our bread and butter, just like it was this past year. But going back to Alabama, I'm I'm not I'm not picking Alabama to win the West. Uh, I'm sorry, and plus their defense was average at best last last year. I mean, yeah. hell, the last two games of the season they they allowed over forty points, uh, and now they're 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 losing like everybody on offense. You do not lose as much as Alabama is losing, and continue to play at a championship level. So Alabama, I'm not picking them to win the West. I think this is probably the first time in about three years that I'm not going to pick Alabama to win the West. Um, my top two te- uh, teams that I'm, I'm looking to win the West, because I always have a favorite, but then I've got like, a, uh, I guess you would say like a dark horse pick, you know, the team that, that, that could get in there if my favorite don't. But um, I'm actually looking – at, uh, Mississippi State, and I'm actually looking at um, LSU. I think LSU is not going to have two bad years like that in a row. Um, they had a pretty damn good recruiting class as well. Um, they beefed up on, on defense. So LSU has always been known, you know, really for defensive football, and uh, they added some depth. Um, so I'm going to have to go with either, yeah, I'm going to have to go with either LSU or Mississippi State. That's that's who I'm looking at to win the West. Over in the East, um, I think it's going to come down to, of course, uh, Georgia or Missouri, and I think that's really by default because Tennessee still hasn't proven shit. Um, Florida had uh, – they ended the day with, like, a, a top 25 recruiting class, but they were, for the longest, they were ranked, like, 102nd in recruiting, and they, they signed one five-star yesterday and I think one or two four-stars that jumped them up a lot, but – other than that, like Florida has had an ass year recruiting, really. Um, I don't look for them to do much. I think they'll be about as, the same as they were last year because they're going to have to, there again, like I talked about with Tennessee, they're going to have to implement this new system. Uh, you got brand new recruits coming in, and I just don't think it's all going to click like that, Florida, from the beginning. Uh, South Carolina is going to be just as bad as they were last year or even worse. Um, they're, they're losing their quarterback, their starting quarterback and starting running back, Mike Davis and Dylan Thompson. I mean, South Carolina, they, they've got to the point where they're back to what they used to be. They really don't have shit. Uh, so I'm not worried about South Carolina. And, of course, you got your Vanderbilts and Kentuckys that are going to be at the bottom. So, honestly, it's, it's going to be Georgia or Missouri by default. Uh, so who's your picks? Well, out in the West. Uh, and I, I sort of do the same thing you did with a who I think the favorite will be, and then sort of a who I think a surprise might be. But um, I'm also jumping off of the Alabama train. Uh, not that I was ever really on it, but uh, I, I don't see them winning uh, the West next year. Um, of course, they're going to have at least one SEC loss that we know of because they have to play UGA. Uh, <laughs> yep. So it's hard for me to go with them. Mississippi State, I think, will be interesting to watch because they do get – they return probably one of the best players as far as Dak Prescott goes. Um, now, I know there's some people that have some mixed feelings on on him, but, you know, he uh, – you, you don't become a Heisman favorite for – six, seven weeks of the season by accident. I mean, there's something there. Um, so I think Mississippi State uh, is is interesting to watch for next year. But um, I'm actually going to go with Auburn to win the West next year. Uh, I think as much as I hate Will Muschamp for coaching at Florida when he had no business doing that, being a UGA graduate, now he's just making matters worse by going over to Auburn. Of course, he's already made his stop at Alabama, so he's just coaching everywhere but Georgia on the way he's trying to prove that. 
But um, I do think their defense under Will Muschamp will be a lot better next year, regardless of how much I hate Will Muschamp. The guy can coach and recruit defense. There's no arguing that. Um, so I, my favorite to win the West next year is going to be Auburn. As far as a surprise pick or an underdog or a dark horse, I'm going to go with Texas A&M. Um, I know they've had some off-the-field issues with quarterbacks lately. Uh, of course, starting with Johnny Manziel, he sort of set the bar pretty high. Then they get this Kenny Hill, who changes his name to Kenny Trill. Then he can't behave. He got suspended the last couple of games of the year. He's transferred. Um, but um, the 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 best thing that Texas A and M got for next year isn't even a player. It, it it's a it's John Chavis stealing John Chavis away from LSU was huge, uh, in my opinion. Texas A and M, so you know, regardless. You say what you want about them. They're one of these teams, you know, they've been scoring the 40 and 50 points a game. Problem is they give up 40 or 50 points a game. If John Chavis can come in there and turn that defense around, that could be a scary team. So I don't think they'll be favored to win the West. I don't think they should be a favorite to win the West. But uh, I'll pick them as my surprise or, or dark horse team because I, I feel like if things fall the right way for them, that they could surprise a lot of people next year. We know they're going to score some points. So if John Chavis can get in there and, Turn that defense around. I think they'll be a scary team. Um, well, uh, yeah. going back to uh, what you said about Auburn. Well, um, you do know Auburn. They're losing their starting running back, Cameron Artis Payne. They lost Nate Marshall, and I want to say it was Sammy Coates, the one of those two good receivers they had. I mean, so they're losing uh, their, their main production offensively, and we know that their backup quarterback is really not a a runner. And honestly. That's where Gus Malzahn has succeeded on offense is with the, the mobile quarterback. I mean, can you honestly see a pocket passer succeeding in that uh, offense as far as making a run to win the division? Well, he's, defi- he's definitely not as athletic as Nick Marshall, but I, I, w- I don't know if I would consider Jeremy Johnson to be a pocket passer. I mean, he, I think he's going to run that Gus Malzahn offense. Now, Nick Marshall ran the ball 25 times a game and threw it 10 times that may reverse itself under Jeremy Johnson. He may throw the ball 25 times a game and run it 10. The package plays will be the same in terms of the style of offense that they run. Um, so, I mean, they are losing a lot. There's no doubt about it. When you, know, when you lose your best receiver, your starting running back, and your starting quarterback, I mean, you know, that's not something that can be easily replaced. But they do have talent there. And, uh you know, a, a lot like Texas A&M, offense was never really the issue with um, Auburn. I mean, even looking at the Alabama game, uh, you know, Georgia was really the only team that slowed Auburn down last year. Um, Auburn pretty much ran up and down the field and everybody else they played. So if Muschamp can get in there and, and, and improve that defense a little bit. Uh, now, of course, it's, it's February fifth or whatever it is, you know, and I, I get that and I'm liable to change my pick a bunch of times between now and 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 the preseason prediction show that we do or whatever. But uh, that's my pick for right for right now. Uh but with the uh, with an asterisk by that that, that that could be subject to change. Uh yep. And in the East of course we'll agree, Georgia. Uh but um I I I kept saying that from now on I was gonna I wasn't gonna underestimate Missouri because I kept underestimating them and they kept winning the East. Um, but the more I think about it, the more I look at it for next year, and I apologize to Missouri fans. I mean, you're right. What else? I, I really don't know what else you can do to prove to me or anyone else that you belong. But for whatever reason, I I don't see you contending again next year. Now you've proven me and everyone else wrong the last two years, and for all I know, you'll do it again next year. But I can't put you in my top two this year. I, I, I actually think it's going to come down to Georgia and Tennessee. Uh, this is something else we've we've talked about. I, I know I'm a lot higher on Tennessee right now than you are, um, Magnum. But um, you know, they are getting you know they returned 95 percent of their team from last year on the two deep. Uh, Joshua Dobbs was a game changer for them the last two or three games of the year uh, compared to what they had before that. Um, 
Jalen Hurd, I think, is a, a legitimate SEC caliber running back. They, I'm not Tennessee had their scared. chance to impress me when they played Missouri last year, and they couldn't even beat Missouri. Yeah. So, you True. know, Tennessee, I can't take Tennessee serious at all, especially since they got this bum-ass offensive coordinator. I, I just don't see it. Yeah. And, you know, I'd love to see him struggle again. Uh, you know, watching BBD struggle through another six and six season would be amazing on, on YouTube. I'd love that. Uh, you know, I really would. Uh, but I don't know. It just, for some reason, it's like, okay, I keep not believing in Missouri and Missouri keeps winning, but yet I still don't buy into them. But with Tennessee, it's the opposite. I keep hearing how good they're about to be. I do buy into it. I'm proven wrong. But then here we go again now next year. I'm a believer again that Tennessee turns it around next year. So I'm not sure what's wrong with me. I mean, obviously, I have any number of sicknesses and diseases. Uh, that's well, we'll give, you, we'll give you a pass right now because we all know that, that you're high you know, on medication right now. So we'll give you a pass. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, so I keep I keep talking up Tennessee, even though they keep not doing anything. I keep running Missouri down, and all they do is keep winning. And you know, I I keep going back to the same arguments over and over, uh, and over again. So I'm not sure what's wrong with me there. But once again, here I am going into another season thinking, okay, Tennessee really really could be a legitimate team this year. Uh, will will that Will that turn out to be the case? Well, history tells me no, uh, that it won't. But uh, as of right now, I guess I'm buying Tennessee stock. Yeah, well, I can't, I can't buy into Tennessee until until Tennessee starts actually winning some of their rivalry games. I mean, for fuck's sake, they got losing streaks to everybody. So until they could actually break one of these losing streaks, I cannot take them seriously. Um, uh, it's been a while since I could actually take them serious. I mean, now that they go and hire this uh, <clears throat> trash bum offensive coordinator who hasn't even been in football in several years, I mean, to me that 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 should tell you everything you need to know about Tennessee. And you know, they 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 go through, they've been going through coaches like fucking snack cakes over the years. Uh, now they're bringing another offensive coordinator, and then the, that AD they had, you know, he was let go. I mean, they. They cannot keep a stable program for shit. I mean, there, there's a reason why Tennessee has been bad. I mean, I just, I just think their program is is a dumpster fire right now. Yeah, that's true. I mean, they've got a lot of distractions, a lot of changes. Uh, that, that thing with the offensive coordinator really just, uh, I don't get that. But like I said, you, you, you said you. Uh, you're on a lot of these SEC fan pages and things like that on Facebook. But, I mean, there's some Tennessee fans who, you know, if Butch Jones holds a press conference to tell everybody that the sky is is green, uh, you got people that aren't even going to go look to see. They're just going to automatically believe it because Butch Jones said so. I don't know what he's doing, some kind of voodoo mind control um, over over those people. Uh, maybe he has his own miniature heart machine. I don't know. Uh, but, I mean, people just buy in and believe everything that guy says, hook, line, and sinker. And now he's done got them convinced that the answer to all their offensive problems is somebody who's been unable to get a job in college football for the last several years. Uh, so I'm not sure what's wrong with me. Well, like, like I said, you're, you're all doped up on medication right now, so we'll give you we'll give you that 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 free pass right now. You get to pass go and collect that two hundred dollars. <laughs> all right, but, uh, let me let me let me let me ask you this: um, Do you do you think that the state of Mississippi, and when I say the state of Mississippi, Mississippi State and Ole Miss, do you think that uh, Ole Miss? I mean, I know they kind of fell off toward the end of the year, but do you think Ole Miss will at least put up a fight and maybe, you know, have a late season run where they may actually compete for the West? Do you think that defense will still be pretty good? 
I do think their defense is still going to be – yes, I do. Um, I was never sold on their offense this year to begin with. Um, going all the way back to the first show we ever did, um, and we did we did a thing where we com- where we compare and contrasted the, the different quarterbacks in the SEC. And Bo Wallace was getting a lot of hype coming into the season last year, but that was a by a byproduct of the fact that there were not really any returning quarterbacks. Last year was a weird year for quarterbacks in the SEC. Um, Georgia graduated a four-year starter. Alabama graduated a four-year starter. Um, you know, you had a lot of your, your your traditional good teams have lost four-year starters and were bringing in unknown commodities to quarterback. So you had somebody like Bo Wallace, and people were jumping on the Bo Wallace train. And I'm not saying the kid doesn't have any talent or any ability, but bottom line, Bo Wallace was the same Bo Wallace this this past season that he was the season before that. He's you know he he he's got some physical abilities and talents and things like that, but he's, it's too many mistakes uh, for whatever the reason. It you know I don't know, but. I never trusted Bo Wallace when the game was on the line. Um, you know, so the fact that they're losing him, let's see. Or are they losing him? I don't know. Are they? Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, he's uh, he graduated. Okay, so he's gone. So we're going to have to replace him. Now, Laquan Treadwell, how bad is his leg messed up? Uh, you know, we're not going to really know uh, in, until probably – summer or fall camp when we can see him running around. With, he's without question the best player offensively on that team. It's not even close. Um, you know, he was he was old, he was to Bo Wallace what Amari Cooper was to Blood Um, you know, the the guy was the real deal. Uh you know, he he there's not an NFL team McCon Treadwell doesn't start on tomorrow with Mari Cooper, I mean, you're talking about a once-in-a-generation type talented receiver with, with Laquan Treadwell. Um, so what kind of shape will he be in? Who else do they have coming back? But if I had to pick one of the two, Mississippi, Ole Miss or Mississippi State, I guess I'd have to say Mississippi State has a better chance of having a good year next year because at least they get Dak Prescott back. But that Ole Miss yeah. defense is nothing to, nothing to sneeze at either. I think it's easier to continue along with a strong defense year to year than it is an offense. In other words, once you get once you get a scheme down on defense that works and you start recruiting the types of players that fit well into that scheme, I think it's easier to maintain a dominant defense year after year just plugging in different parts and pieces than it is to maintain a dominant offense. I mean, if you, you know, if you've got a Heisman level quarterback that cannot be replaced um, with some other quarterback the next year. But look at Alabama and LSU. Every year they lose half their team to the NFL, and they're still dominant the, the next year on defense. Now, I know both those teams took a little bit of a step back this year, but you have to admit that's not the norm. Uh, you know, normally Alabama and LSU lose half their team to the NFL, and then they're just as good, if not better, the following year has has been the norm over the last you know, eight to ten years. I just think it's easier to, to to maintain that level of consistency on the defensive side of the ball. So, looking at it that way, you'd lean towards Ole Miss possibly having a better year next year. But um, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to wait and see what's going to happen. To me, there's just too many question marks right now with Ole Miss. How will how how's Tw- Treadwell going to respond to you know his surgery and his rehab and and all these kinds of things? Who's going to be the quarterback? Uh, and all that. So I, if if I have to make a decision right now between Mississippi State and Ole Miss, then I'm taking Mississippi State for next year. Yeah, I think I would have to roll with Mississippi State myself, um, simply because the quarterback position, you know, uh, with Dak Prescott, you know, Prescott coming back and Bo Wallace leaving, you know, when you when you lose a like you said, when you lose a a long time quarterback, I mean, you just really cannot replace that i mean i mean look at us you know we had to replace a a four-year starter in aaron murray and you know hudson mason comes in and he was nothing like aaron murray it's just you can't 
I, I just don't I just don't think you can replace. I mean, even though Bo Wallace, like you said, I, I think he was a turnover waiting to happen. But at the same time, if, if Ole Miss had anything better, then they would have played him. So, uh, yeah. you know, Bo Wallace was obviously the best they had. He gave them the best chance of winning. So I, I, I don't know how the new quarterback would be. You know, I, I, like you said, it's too early to say, but um, I just don't – I just cannot – if I had to bet, I just cannot say Ole Miss is that team. I would have to put my money on Mississippi State. And I know, uh, like you were talking about, you know, a lot of teams lost their quarterbacks, but when we look at Georgia, yeah, we lost Hudson Mason. And me and you have talked about this many times. We lost our worst player. On offense, we are actually upgrading at quarterback with uh, Bryce Ramsey. That I mean, so when people want to throw out, well, who y'all got at quarterback? What do you mean it was that quarterback? We actually upgraded. Uh, Ramsey is more mobile. He's got a, a, a better, a much better arm. So I don't want to hear that shit. We actually upgraded at that position. Oh, oh, all right, yeah. I, I have a question for y'all guys. Uh, j- just, uh, just to throw it out there. Does Ohio State, Florida State, or Oregon make the playoffs once again? Uh, count Florida State out. They're done. Uh, Florida State is, is out of the running now. Uh, the only reason that they were there to begin with, quite frankly, it was Jameis Winston because even though he did throw a lot of interceptions last year, um, he did make a lot of plays that you know brought Florida State back from a deficit and actually got him to win, and he made – some athletic runs, and to me, Jameis Winston was the heart and soul of that team, and they're they're done. Uh, I can see Ohio State uh, making a return uh, because they they've got apparently they've got quarterbacks in the ass up there, and they returned that running back uh, Ezekiel uh, Ezekiel Elliott. So I think Ohio State can make a run. And as far as Oregon is concerned, I think that they're going to have a, a pretty good year. Um, However, losing Marcus Mariota is huge. Um, Mariota made that offense run. And without Mariota, I, I think it's going to take another year or two for Oregon to get back to that, yeah, I guess you would say, the, the, the playoff-style um, team. You know, I just don't, I just don't think Oregon is going to make a run to the playoff this next year because I just think they lost too much. Uh, I, I pretty much completely agree. Uh, Florida State has zero chance to make the playoff. Ohio State has probably the best chance of any. I mean, Ohio State's going to be ranked number one in the preseason, and they have a better chance of making the playoff than any SEC team does just from for scheduling. You know, it's not likely Ohio State will lose a game uh, heading into the playoffs. Uh, as far as Oregon goes, now I know they've lost quarterbacks before, uh, and then gone on the next year and continued to run that same offense and put up 50 or 60 points a year. But they've never lost a Marcus Mariota, to, to your point, Magnum, about Mariota. Um, they've never had an NFL-level quarterback at, at Oregon like they have with Marcus Mariota. So there will be a drop-off for Oregon next year. With that being said, unless Southern Cal – um, I mean, if you're buying the hype on Southern Cal, I guess that's what it comes down to because you look around the Pac-12, and if you're saying Oregon's not going to win it, then, then who, else be, who else are you looking at? Well, you got to go in Stanford. I mean, even though Stanford had somewhat of a down year this past year, I mean, that's still a physical football team. They always seem to put together, like you said, they always seem to have a very good defense out there, and I agree with you what you said earlier in the year. The one team out – over there in the Pac-12 that plays SEC-style defense is Stanford. So I don't think you can ever count out Stanford as far as, you know, making a, a push to win the Pac-12. Now, will they make the playoff? I don't know. That's way too early. But it, I will say that I think they're going to at least compete to win win the Pac-12. I mean, Stanford, they just – I don't know what it is. They always just put a really good defense out there. And I don't think UCLA is going to be – in the running, I know they they lose Britt Hundley, and he was the sole reason they even won all those games last year. So, uh, quite frankly, it's going to come down to USC, Oregon, or or Stanford. So, uh, hey, I'm not sure if you want to keep going or not, but I have to get off. I have to do a um, I have to do an ice thing on my knee here, so I have to get off now. But um, yeah, we're about to wrap the show up. It's been going on okay. for almost an hour and ten minutes, so uh, we'll we'll wrap it up. 
All right, guys. Well, thanks for uh, listening, and uh, I want to thank everybody too for uh, there were some really nice comments that a lot of you people left on my um, YouTube videos over the last couple of days. Um, you know, wishing me good health and good luck and quick recovery and all all those kinds of things. So, in all seriousness, I know we, you know, we like to get on here and and talk a lot of trash to each other and uh, you know, run each other into the ground and things like that. But, um, you know, for the most part, um, you know, all you guys were, were seemed generally concerned about me. So thank you, uh, for that. Uh, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm healing up. I'll be back to new, uh, at some point down the road. Thanks for your concern. Good morning and go dogs. Too. Yeah. Well, appreciate, uh, all you guys listening in. Uh, if, if some breaking news happens and, it's worthy of a show. We'll get back up on here and do another show. So, but uh, until then, uh, I guess we will holler at you guys next time. Uh, go dogs. <laughs>